there's disaster everywhere. I just feel bad for everybody. That's devastating. I mean, it's like everything's gone. This is News Channel 8's special report, the flood of 2007. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to News Channel 8's special coverage of the flood of 2007. I'm Martha Kowalski. And I'm Jennifer Livingston. It's being called historic and record-setting, but for many of our friends and neighbors, the flooding that happened a little more than a week ago is simply devastating. So tonight, we want to take a look at the storm that brought the rain and the aftermath that will be dealt with for months, if not years, to come. For those of us not impacted, we are still trying to comprehend the enormity of what has happened to so many communities. Lives have been lost, homes are gone. Well, for this next hour, we'll walk you through how it happened and what happens next. We're gonna begin tonight with the storm that caused the floods. Here with more is Storm Team 8 meteorologist, Bill Grawl. Sitting here in the storm center that night and watching this weather situation take shape is something I will never forget. The area was under a flash flood watch since early that morning and light to moderate rain had been falling for most of the day, but that was nothing compared to what was to come that night. That evening, a narrow but intense line of thunderstorms developed over southeastern Minnesota. It then spread across the river into southwestern Wisconsin, bringing very heavy rain to the La Crosse area by about 8 o'clock. And it's a, about that time when several flash flood warnings were issued. Flash flood warnings remain in effect for La Crosse County until 1145, about another 15 minutes. The line of storms then stalled and became a classic setup of what we call training thunderstorms, where storms develop and then train or follow a path over the same areas, usually resulting in heavy rain. In fact, I'll never forget showing our tri-state radar loop and how the line of training thunderstorms stretched all the way from the La Crosse area westward up to near Aberdeen, South Dakota. By around 10 o'clock is when I started thinking we were really getting into a dangerous situation with all the video coming back to the station of significant street flooding around La Crosse and I was getting reports of four to six inches of rain falling in some areas in only about two to three hours time. Things are uh, getting worse minute by minute. Just over an hour later, it was apparent that this was now a devastating and life-threatening situation as we were getting several reports of mudslides, roads and bridges washing out, and whole towns being evacuated. The Winona County Emergency Management is evacuating the city of Stockton. It was also around that time that I got a couple of reports of more than 12 inches of rain falling in some areas. Get out of your homes and get to a higher uh, uh, part of the city or a higher part of your area as quickly as possible. Once the rain finally let up and night turned to day, it became quite clear that this most likely was a weather event that most of us will never see again. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Unbelievable. And almost immediately after the storm passed, we began to realize the magnitude of what had just happened as the damage reports began rolling in. Here now with a look at just how widespread the flooding reached is News Channel 8's Mike Thompson. Well, for many of us, it's hard to wrap our hands around just how many people were affected by this huge disaster. At least six counties in Minnesota and five counties in Wisconsin received some sort of storm damage, and the pictures are unbelievable. In the city of Goodview in Winona County, main streets became rivers. Emergency crews used airboats to rescue people, some from the rooftops of their own homes. Floodwaters forced dozens of families to flee the Lakeside Manor apartment complex in Goodview as the water level rose above the top of garages, swallowing cars in the parking lot. The community of Stockton was virtually shut off to the outside world. Washed out roads and mudslides made rescue efforts in the small town difficult. It was one of the area's hardest hit in the county. In Minnesota City, homes literally dangled from the hillside. Winona, St. Charles, and Lewiston all felt the wrath of the floods. In the city of Hoka in Houston County, the heavy rain caused dozens of mudslides, uprooting trees, flipping some vehicles on their sides, and flooding homes, farm fields, and major roadways. In Brownsville, several people survived as their houses were literally pushed over the bluff by a mudslide. Debris blocked the main highway in and out of town. The city of Houston was spared the worst after the levee on the Root River held, but still many residents there returned to their homes after a mandatory evacuation, only to find feet of water in their basement. In Fillmore County, the floods left the city of Rushford almost completely underwater. Take a look at these photos sent in to us from a viewer. Once again, streets became small rivers, and when the water receded, it left behind a muddy mess. 
Authorities say about two-thirds of the city had some sort of flood damage. On the Wisconsin side of the river, it wasn't much better. In Crawford County, the communities of Gays Mills and Soldiers Grove were hit especially hard. These pictures shot from a bluff above show almost the entire town of Gays Mills again underwater. Crawford County emergency management officials say as much as a foot of rain fell in less than 24 hours there. The heavy downpours flooded more than 200 homes in both communities. In Vernon County, mudslides devastated a lot of roadways and bridges. There was also concern about the integrity of several dams in the county. This is video sent in by a viewer of water spilling over the Runge Hollow Dam. Residents that live below the dam were evacuated because they feared this very thing would happen. In La Crosse County, a huge mudslide closed Highway 35, just south of the city of La Crosse. The power of the mudslide derailed an idle train and even moved homes from their foundations. The town of Shelby received the most damage in the county. Many homeowners on the south side of La Crosse were also dealing with flooded basements. Well, pictures really do say a thousand words, but for many of the people who were affected by these devastating floods, words will never describe the nightmare they lived through. In Brownsville, Mike Thompson, News Channel 8. Well, the damage is absolutely overwhelming, but certainly the most tragic story to come out of the flooding is the loss of life. Well, seven people died as a result of the raging waters, five in Winona County alone, including 80-year-old Victor Gensmer and his 68-year-old wife, Joyce of Watoka. They died when their car was swept off County Road 17 and went into a water-filled gully. 67-year-old John McHale and his 66-year-old wife, Shirley of Lewiston, were also killed when their, wa their car rather was taken off of County Road 20 three north of Stockton. Also, the body of 37-year-old Jared Lorenz of Lewiston was found wrapped around a tree about four miles from where his car was turned upside down near a flooded creek in Winona County. And two people were also killed in Houston County. David Ask of Houston stayed put in his mobile home while neighbors evacuated to higher ground. After the storm, his body and pieces of his trailer were found scattered about. The seventh fatality was 37-year-old David Blackburn of Spring Grove, who drowned after his foot got wedged between his vehicle and a tree. What makes Blackburn's death particularly tragic is that he died while saving the life of his wife. It is a heartbreaking story of love and sacrifice. Dawn Blackburn, her husband David, and a friend were returning home from dinner during the storm when the bridge they were crossing overflowed with water. The rapid was so forceful. Their friend managed to get to safety, but Dawn and David were swept away with the truck. Moments later, they came crashing into a tree, lodging David's leg between a branch and his truck. I reached on, I grabbed onto his hand, and I said, this is a life-death situation. And he says, yeah, Dawn, it is. I'm going to get you up on this tree. I'm going to get you to safety, Dawn. And he pushed me up the tree with his leg caught. He pushed me up on the tree, and he said he loved me. He did. A short time later, David disappeared into the water. Dawn says her husband died a hero. A man laid down his life for another person's life. That's what he did. He loved everybody, and he was a wonderful father. He still is, because he lives in our hearts. He does. We loved him so much. David Blackburn worked at Mike and Sports in Caledonia. He leaves behind his wife and four children. Such a heart-wrenching story. And still ahead in our Flood of 2007 special, every town affected has a story to tell. We're going to visit many of the communities hardest hit by the waters and talk to residents about the destruction.
communities have been impacted and each one has a different story to tell. Well, as we said earlier, the scope of the flooding is so massive, it's really hard to know where to begin. So we're covering the damage geographically, starting with the communities in Minnesota. In the small town of Rushford, people there watched in horror as the Root River continued to rise. Mark McPherson brings us the story. One of the area's hardest hit was here in Rushford, Minnesota, where authorities say two-thirds of the town was affected by flood damage. People here have now joined with National Guard as well as city and county officials starting the long task of cleaning up. It's devastating. I mean, it's like everything's gone. I've never been through anything like this. You don't have time to cry. If you cry, you sit there for hours crying. There's no time to mourn in Rushford as the task of cleaning up the flooded city begins. Is that um, supply stuff in there? The National Guard joins city and county officials in helping residents dry out. Everybody's helping each other out and, and uh, make the process go a little bit easier, I guess. Without power, water, or phone, Doug Hughes has plenty of time to take stock of the tragedy. He got quite a bit of water and the next place down had floating appliances and wow. it just got worse as you got towards the creek. The Hughes house is actually on a little bit higher ground so he was the last house in the neighborhood not to get any water in the basement but as you can see in his backyard just about 100 feet away this trailer park was completely flooded. There's water up past my knees and in our living room. After opening her front door and seeing what she called a four foot wave heading her way Ellen Johnson was able to escape the flood but lost everything. Almost everyone lost something. Mm -hmm. And you lost? Um, I lost two homes. It's scary because that was my home. Everything in there is, most of my stuff is all below that level, but I no longer have a home. And as the community begins the cleanup, they say they're doing it together. Everyone helped out. Everyone stuck together, and that's all I can say. Right now, crews are working 24 hours a day trying to get this city back on its feet, hoping someday it will recover. Also down the Root River was another city in this storm's path, Houston, Minnesota, where rains came quickly without warning, prompting city officials to evacuate the entire area. When residents returned to Houston, they found mostly flooded basements, and here at nearby Money Creek, they found a lot worse. With Blackhawks circling overhead, residents that had evacuated Houston slowly make their way back, not knowing exactly what to expect. Yeah, you, you hope you know, but you don't know. People like Heidi Carrier escaped the storm, only to return home to a basement full of water. We have um, probably about three and a half, four feet of water in our basement. With water up to the ceiling, Carrier knows she's lost everything in her basement, but still considers herself lucky. I guess I was coming, expecting to come back to a lot more damage in the house and around town. I'm, I'm very thankful that we have this limited. It's pretty surprising just how much damage water can do. In places like Houston, it's a lot of flooded basements, but here at Money Creek, it's a whole lot more. It's just devastating. Money Creek campsite was swallowed by a flash flood that swept through with startling power. There's a semi-trailer across the road in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. The water was actually halfway up on that semi-trailer's box. So that's how high the water, deep the water was. People at the campsite had to be rescued out of trees and flooded campers, and Fitting was surprised it wasn't much worse. It's just totally amazing that, that nobody lost their life. They are two towns that are separated by only 10 miles, sharing one tragedy. From Rushford and Houston, I'm Mark McPherson. And a really uplifting story in the Houston community comes from an unlikely place because normally this time of year, high school football teams are using every minute they can just to get ready for the football season. But for the Houston team, another priority came up for several days last week. The guys sacrificed some of their time on the practice field in order to help out around the community. We caught up with them at practice, but earlier about 30 of the football players and coaches helped pitch in with uh, sandbagging, cleaning out people's basements, and carrying out countless loads of trash. Coaches and players say they really wanted to lend a helping hand. We feel that uh, in a time like this, football really comes second and uh, the community needs help. And uh, we have plenty of able bodies who are willing to uh, step up in the community and uh, really do their civic duty by helping out the community. What most people need is just an extra pair of hands. So, you know, that's what we try to do as a football team. It's just easier to, to get things done quick if we have extra people. 
Well, nearly the entire team helped out, Martha. I say nearly because Coach Freed says, unfortunately, a few of the players couldn't participate because bad roads kept them from getting into town. So uh, a good deed done by the football team there. All right. Well, water was only part of the problem for many homeowners, too, because the mudslides that resulted from the wet soil flattened many homes, including several in the town of Brownsville, located just southeast of Houston. And that's where News Channel 8's Jenna Sachs is with an amazing story of survival. 17 years ago, the Partingtons built their dream home on the side of a bluff in Brownsville. Sunday morning, they watched it all wash away. What's left is an amazing story of survival. I guess we're just thankful to be here, to I be able to even tell the story. Looking at the Partingtons' home, it's hard to believe anyone could survive a collapse like this. But both Sharon and Lynn and their nine-year-old grandson, Austin, did. I heard this crunching or explosion or uh, uh, it was actually the avalanche on the hill. Lynn was helping a next door neighbor clean up a smaller mudslide when it happened. I saw the house just uh, level and it was like it, the mud just went underneath and just wiped it out and the roof just dropped to the ground. All of a sudden I saw the wall of mud hit the kitchen windows and it blew them out right at me and I turned and it toward the living room and it just threw me. As she lay under debris, both Sharon and her husband had one thing on their minds, Austin, who had been sleeping in an upstairs bedroom. And then my grandson was screaming first, like a nightmare scream. And then he kept screaming for us and I kept screaming to him to stay there, stay there. And that's when I got the strength and the power and I just crawled off that, out from under. I just pushed, I pushed the wall, I pushed the debris. And I got out. Outside, Lynn was already rescuing their grandson. I broke the siding and the insulation off and just pulled him through the wall. Right about that time was when he yelled for me and I said, I'm here, where's Austin? He says, I got him. Some way or another, her hand was there and I tore a hole and uh, pulled her out. But they talk just... about people getting that adrenaline. Mm -hmm. and when I heard that child scream, I didn't count. It didn't matter what happened to me. I needed to get to him. Right now, the Partingtons have no plans to rebuild. They did have flood insurance and earthquake insurance, but they are unsure how much money they'll receive. They're waiting to hear if they'll get any assistance from FEMA. And even though the Partington's home is actually in Brownsville, the couple is known and loved around the entire La Crescent community, yep. too. The two are longtime teachers in that school district with a combined 60 years of experience in the classroom. And now the La Crescent community is organizing a couple of benefits to try and help Sharon and Lynn get back on their feet there. Well, from Houston County, we go to Winona County, where the cleanup efforts for many are ongoing. In Goodview, just west of Winona, the Red Cross had to set up a shelter in the hours after the storm. Reporter Bart Winkler has the story there. Flooding evacuated nearly everyone from this apartment complex as residents were forced to find temporary shelter. Now some did have friends and family in the area, but for others, they had a tougher time trying to get their life back on track. While many people in Winona County are in recovery mode, for others, it's time to move on. You could say everything in the house we pretty much lost. Fouad Alabad is one of many taking advantage of the cleaning supplies offered by the United Way. He'll be able to salvage his home, but not everyone is as lucky. I lost my computer from Winona State for sure. I'm getting married in October. I lost a bunch of wedding stuff. Kayla Overing was living at Goodview's Lakeside Manor, but she can't get back in. My apartment is actually way in the back, so it's probably the worst of it all. And it sucks not knowing what is savable or not. Albert Haxton is out of Lakeside Manor as well, still looking for a place to stay, trying to find something a little more private than the Red Cross shelter. We're trying to see if we can get some funding here right now so we can get a motel for the night because I don't want to stay here tonight either. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, it kind of sucks. I mean, it sucks. But as people try to rebuild their lives, they are thankful for the options, thankful for the help that is there. It's good that we cannot complain anything. I mean, something is better than nothing. We're getting good help. As you can see, frustration did start to set in. People still are unable to see what they actually lost. Thankfully, though, everyone did make it out of this apartment complex safely. In Goodview, I'm Bart Winkler.
Now also hard hit in Winona County was the community of Stockton. It's a small town located just southwest of Winona. Photojournalist Adam Strand tags along with one local woman trying to salvage what she can from the mess. Everybody was hit hard. Raining, pouring hard, and the water on the highway here was just rushing. We had no idea the water came inside. Then the electricity went off at a quarter after one. Tele then the telephone went out. And uh, they were rescuing people here uh, by canoe. Watch the nail there. Trying to help my mother-in-law out by getting rid of all the, everything that's been damaged and it's quite a bit. So they're ripping up all of the carpeting and throwing it out and we have to throw away a lot of things that got so soaked in that mud. Well, if it can be rebuilt, I'm sure we'll rebuild it. We'll have to wait till FEMA gets here and I guess see what they think. It's very sad and, and it's depressing. Yep, everyone's safe here. It could have been much worse. Just take it at a day at a time and, and uh, see what the future holds. And one of the most amazing stories out of Stockton comes from Roger and Bonnie Oldham. Now, when the couple's house filled up with water, they actually climbed to the top of their roof to wait for help. But moments later, the water ripped their house from its foundation, sending them on a harrowing ride through town. The house floated about 1,000 feet through the yards of their neighbors when it finally slammed into some railroad tracks. The Oldham screamed for help for more than five hours when finally a firefighter spotted them and came to their rescue remarkably there were no serious injuries. Throughout the evening, we've been sharing with you many of the unbelievable pictures sent into WKBT.com by viewers all over the Cooley region. Well, we've also gotten several home videos. Parts of Minnesota City, located just northwest of Winona, were smacked hard by the raging waters from local creeks. Phil from Minnesota took these amazing shots showing just how powerful the water was there. You can see it looks like a semi truck was knocked right over. This is yet another example of just how much water was dumped on these cities and towns and just how fast the water was really moving. And when we come back, we cross the border to Wisconsin. And focus on the communities this side of the Mississippi. Back to News Channel 8 special report on the flood of 2007. What makes this disaster so unique is just how widespread the destruction is. At least 11 counties through two states and millions of dollars in damage. Well, so far tonight we've looked at several of the Minnesota communities. Now we focus on areas in Wisconsin impacted by the rain. The Crawford County town of Gaze Mills lies right along the banks of the Kickapoo River, making that community extremely vulnerable to its rising waters. Most of the town was underwater from the heavy rains, including 75 homes. Some say they have lost everything. Now, more than a week later, the waters have receded, but the cleanup will continue for a long time to come. A little community like this, everybody's family, you know, so everybody pitches in. Doesn't matter who you are or anything else, you just pitch in wherever you can. Well, speaking of pitching in, when the storm hit Soldiers Grove, it released a fast current of water onto an apartment complex and senior citizen home, sparking a large scale evacuation. But with the help of several emergency responders, this story has a muddy but happy ending. Jenna Sachs is in Soldiers Grove with the story. It's a mess, but we're dealing with it. A lot of mud, a lot of water, a lot of water damage on walls. 
It's dirty work, but management at Golden Acres Apartments is grateful it isn't worse. These three yeah. tubes plugged on the other side. No water was even coming through. So that big wall of water was like a dam behind there. When floodwaters started building on the road above her apartment, Janet Jamison never expected this. I'll never forget that. I just think if it had totally washed, I wouldn't have a home right now. Eventually, a landslide collapsed the bridge, releasing a current around the Golden Acre. And can you explain maybe how the water came down? <laughs> Fast. <laughs> Actually, I had somebody wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell me that the hallway was flooded. So I went down there, and there was probably about four inches of water there. Dumped out 11 inches in a little over 24 hours, wasn't it, Gary? Yeah, yeah. So there was plenty of water coming. I can't say enough for the fire department and uh, the people that came to uh, get people out of here. I just think that everybody really did a great job as far as police department, fire department, and rescue squads and all that. I really think they all did a real bang up job. In Soldiers Grove, Jenna Sachs, News Channel 8. We've talked about so many of the small communities impacted by the flood, but La Crosse residents were not spared from the waters either. However, unlike so many other areas, the damage here was fairly localized. With more on La Crosse County, here's News Channel 8's Bill Bessett. This is now a familiar sight on La Crosse's south side. These road signs tell drivers that Highway 35 is still closed and they have to take a detour. What they don't say, though, is just how much damage our storms cause in La Crosse and also nearby Vernon County. Take a look at this. This is why the highway was closed. A huge mudslide wiped out the road from La Crosse all the way to Vernon County. Now, the mudslides were so powerful, they also knocked over this idle train. The flooding also made many homes along Highway 35 unlivable. We're cleaning up, doing the best we can. And uh, I hope uh, there's some help out here, you know, that we can, we can uh, rebuild or get back on our feet. For some, it seemed the rain would never stop. On La Crosse's south side, the heavy rain stalled cars and also turned the cemetery into a lake. The storm left behind a big mess, especially in the town of Shelby. We've got roads that are buckled. We've got uh, roads that are giving way. We've got houses that are just, that's just full of mud. We've got a real mess in the town of Shelby. We really do have a disaster here. And as folks do their best now to clean up from one of the worst storms in our history, they realize it could have been much worse. You know, it doesn't do any good to cry and you know, there's nothing you can do about it. So you just have to take it with a grain of salt. A lot of memories that will never be able to be replaced, but you know, it's still got the life, so that's the best part. You know, I got a chance to talk with some folks who couldn't go home the night that Highway 35 was closed. One family had just returned from Arizona where their flight was delayed some six hours. They were just hoping to get home and relax, but as we know now, that didn't happen. What that family had to do, though, was go buy some pillows at the nearby Walmart store, and they actually slept in their car overnight in the parking lot. And they weren't alone. A lot of other folks had to do the same thing. That turned the nearby quick trip and parking lots over at Walmart into temporary campgrounds. In La Crosse County, I'm Bill Besant. You know, one of the most common stories over the past several days are people heading to their basements. You mm -hmm. probably know somebody who's had to do this. I know somebody to bail out all the water that seeped in. Yeah, and flash floods poured water into the lower level of homes all over La Crosse. A house on 30th Street on the south side took in what looked to be about a foot and a half of standing water inside their basement. And many other people around the city had to do the exact same thing. Well, coming up next, water is one of the most powerful and underestimated weather elements will break down just how dangerous it can be. And how will this flood go down in history? We'll find out just ahead. You're watching News Channel 8's special report on the flood of 2007.
As we have come to expect from this great community that we live in, when tragedy strikes, heroes emerge. And that definitely happened in Stoddard, just south of La Crosse in Vernon County, when a fun outing turned into a nightmare. Jenna Sachs is there with the story. Well, Jen and Martha, it's six and a half hours of their lives. 13 people say they'll never forget. They were on a tour of area restaurants and bars when their bus got stuck here on Highway 162 between two fallen landslides. Now they say they can't thank the Stoddard Fire Department enough. There was one point in time where, you know, I thought we were gone. We were going to be done. And you'd never think that it happened in Wisconsin. As far as another bus ride goes, I don't know if I'll be able to do one right now. What was supposed to be a fun night on the bus turned into a nightmare for these passengers. During the storm early Sunday morning, they found themselves trapped between two landslides surrounded by rushing water. We were on the only high ground that was left. There was nothing on either side anymore. I mean, the water was getting higher and higher and higher. You can see the current. It was just so rapid. You watch these stories on the weather report, you know, where the current is so bad. CNN. This is what we experienced. Passengers say those six and a half hours were the scariest of their lives. A lot of us couldn't sleep because the lightning would strike and it was so close. I had everybody grab hands and, and we said the Lord's Prayer. They managed to call the Stoddard Fire Department, but with the road blocked on both sides, they couldn't reach the bus. We decided we had to find other routes, so we went up over the ridges and down through the coolies trying to find access. We used a chainsaw to get down the side roads in order to eventually get access to Highway 162. After firefighters reached the bus, they started escorting the passengers through the water in groups of two to nearby homes. That fireman literally picked me up and carried me to where the road was. By the time the sun rose, passengers were all safe in a nearby home. I'm really, really thankful for the fire department in Stoddard. They were unreal. Now there were two people with diabetes on that bus. Firefighters were even able to get them their medication. That same night, firefighters delivered a baby at their fire station, so everyone here had a very busy night. In Stoddard, I'm Jenna Sachs. That is amazing. A busy night, I yeah. would say. <laughs> and now it's, of course, one thing for a firefighter to come to the rescue. Yeah, it's not every day you find an average Joe willing to risk his life for another. That's exactly what happened, though, in the small town of Chaseburg, just east of Stoddard. That's where Bart Winkler is with this story. As quick as the rain fell, people's decisions had to be even quicker. And for one Chaseburg man, his quick thinking turned him into an unlikely hero. It was either, yeah help them tonight or look for their body tomorrow. As the water flooded the road near his Chaseburg home, Bruce Von Ruden had no choice but to become a hero. The water was coming up so fast that I knew soon enough that somebody wasn't going to get through. Sure enough, a car come and come around the corner, hit the water and was immediately afloat. There were two people in the car and when they tried to get out, they became in immediate danger. They couldn't stand in it, so they got swept down and grabbed a corner post here and huddled around that and started yelling that uh, they need some help and pretty soon one of them said uh, do whatever you're going to do real fast because we can't hang on much longer. With his front yard now immersed in water, Von Ruden's only chance for rescue was to get to his boat that was in his garage. I grabbed it and pushed it out as far as I could until the tires got sunk in the mud. Pushed it off the trailer and come out and they were, they were happy to see me. Von Ruden pulled the men into his boat to safety but his night was far from over. One of the guys that I actually just rescued looked down and said there's another car. He was already floating, chest high in water, sitting in his car. But with the current against him, Von Ruden wasn't sure if the third man would be able to call him a hero. I had my doubts before I left because I knew he was already filling up with water before I'd even left. But uh, when we got there, he was he was floating in his, in his car and still had plenty of room and plenty of air. He was able to pull the third man out of the car, get him into the boat, and bring him to safety as well. Bruce Von Ruden just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It's truly amazing. I, I would have never dreamt that, uh, but it came on so fast and it was there. You didn't have time to think about it. You just had to do it. This is just one case of heroism as a result of the flood. There are probably many out there that we'll never even know of. Outside of Chaseburg, I'm Bart Winkler. Well, ironically, these neighbors never really associated with each other before the flood. Now they're planning to get together over a beer and talk about the unbelievable events that finally broke the ice. Yeah, fast friends. Fast All friends. right. Well, still to come tonight, what's next for the people who've lost so much? We'll take a look at what the federal government has planned. But help is already on the way from this amazing community.
Welcome back. Now, while most of the families impacted have insurance, unfortunately, for most, flooding is not typically part of the plan. Yeah, so when the Federal Emergency Management Agency gave the green light for federal funds to help rebuild, there was a huge sigh of relief. News Channel 8's Bart Winkler has the story. As the days progressed, people started to gather together to help one another, but also got a little frustrated. That's when FEMA finally came to town. You have your life totally turned upside down. Um, Try to get everything tore out and I don't know, how's the week been for you? Buddy Westerberg is just one of many Stockton residents shaken up by the damaging floods. I mean, there's times when you like to just say, not to the point of killing yourself or something, but there's times that you like to just say, I'd rather die than see this mess. Their lives changed forever. Residents have spent the last week cleaning and waiting. Basically what we do now is we sta stand around and wait for people to show up, like FEMA, and people to tell us if we're going to get help. Just days after the flooding, that help did arrive. Teams from FEMA toured communities all over southeastern Minnesota for a series of damage assessments. You know that in any type of a disaster like this, uh, any kind of damage to that person is catastrophic. FEMA saw the disaster and acted quickly. Winona, Fillmore, and Houston counties were declared a federal disaster area just hours after FEMA had arrived. Stockton residents will now get the help they so desperately need. And that includes rental assistance, uh, that includes any medical care that's not covered by insurance, uh, repair to their homes, uh, or replace parts of re partial replacement of their home. It's not a lot of money, but it's at least it'll help them get back on their feet. Whether it's assistance through the government or just through each other, this is a community looking to rebuild. In Stockton, I'm Bart Winkler. And just over the weekend, President Bush issued a disaster declaration for the five counties in Wisconsin impacted. They include Crawford, La Crosse, Richland, Sauk, and also Vernon counties. And though, even though with the federal assistance in some cases, it won't even begin to cover the cost of what some people have mm -hmm. lost. But as we have seen in the past, people in the Cooley region have a remarkable way of lending a hand to those in need. Since 2001, local media outlets, normally competitors on a regular day, have joined together three times to help raise funds. September 11th, the Southeast Asia tsunami and Hurricane Katrina will Friday reunite it again. Hey, thank you very much for coming out. Good morning. How are you today? Thank you very much. Peter, appreciate it. Good morning. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming in today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. It just never ceases to amaze me how great this community is. We were both there all day on yep. Friday. Did you have a favorite moment? One of the things that really lifted my spirits is when uh, PAC 68, the Cub Scouts, oh. showed up and they decided to spend the day in front of Festival Foods in Alaska and just with their little group of boys raised three thousand oh. dollars and showed up at the end of the day they didn't even know how much they'd raise over the check yeah. oh that's so great for me i think uh, the thing that sums up this community the most for me a guy drove up he handed me a check for a hundred dollars and i said thank you so much it's going to a great cause and he said well actually I got flood damage, but mine's not as worse as some of the uh, people that I've seen. It's not as bad as some of the that I've seen. And so he handed a check over to help out those who uh, were 
had even more damage. Yeah, I think seven nice ending to a really terrible week, that's for sure. Well, so far more than $300,000 has already been raised from the drive. And again, all of that money will benefit our local chapter of the American Red Cross. So if you didn't get a chance to donate on Friday, funds are still being accepted. And here's how to do it. Send a check to the Scenic Bluffs chapter of the American Red Cross, specifying that it's very important to ensure that the money stays right here at home. The address is 2927 Losey Boulevard South, La Crosse, Wisconsin 54601, or you can make an online donation by visiting www.arc scenicbluffs.org. And speaking of the web, online information proved to be vital in the hours and days following the floods, not only as a way for us to get the story to our viewers, but also as a way for our viewers to get their story to all of us. Here with more on that is our newsroom assignment editor, Adam Hatfield. While the scope of damage in the flood of 2007 was and still is hard to comprehend, the amount of information we received here in the newsroom was unprecedented. From the moment the storm hit to the aftermath, the internet was a vital resource to relay the latest damage reports, road closures, and ways to get flood assistance to our viewers. The web was also a forum for people affected by the flood to share pictures and video of the devastation in a way we have never seen before. Here in the newsroom, we were stunned by the number of people who shared their stories through snapshots and amazing home video. These contributions brought people together and helped them grasp the enormity of this disaster. As the flood cleanup progresses, the web will continue to be an important source of information for Cooley Region residents. From the newsroom, I'm Adam Hatfield. Now, if you would like to see more of the viewer photos and videos of the storm, they are still available on our website at WKBT.com. All right, when we come back, some final thoughts on the flood of 2007. Please stay with us.
All you could see was water. There was no homes, nothing. It's devastating. You know, this little town is, you know, not been through this much damage and it's just devastating. And all these people pulling together to clean up all this mess and people who've lost homes. My house is underwater right now and I just want to go home. Water's up to the decks, almost in the houses. Just total disaster. We looked out back and we saw all the trees going down and the creek that was 10 feet wide is now wider than the Mississippi, so it's, it's pretty intense. Trying to figure out what we're going to do now because I'm kind of clueless. I'm so sad. We don't know where we're going to go to live. You know, I have two young children. This is their backyard. It's hard. We're going to have a lot of help, though. There's a lot of family and friends that are willing to help, and it'll be OK. Everybody's just doing what they can to pull through. You just do the best you can and pick up a shovel. It's just hard. So one day at a time, we'll be OK.